we get started, I'd like to quickly thank our Making It Work sponsors. They are Cross Insur Insurance, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, Katahdin Trust, and Memic. And now I'd like to introduce Harvard Pilgrim's Director of Sales in Maine, Bill Barasa, to say a few words. Take it away, Bill. Great. Thank you, Kate. Hello to everyone. Uh, on behalf of Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, I'm happy to say hello, say a few words, welcome everybody to this event. Like all of you, I, I enjoy joining these uh, and hearing from different panelists um, and getting a perspective from around the state. So it, it's great. Uh, we are all in this together. So it's wonderful to, to hear uh, from everyone. Uh, for Harvard Pilgrim, we are uh, still your insurance company. We're here to uh, protect the needs of our members and uh, in times of need, as well as uh, provide opportunities through some virtual events over the last couple of months to spread our wellness activities, uh, mindfulness, as well as some, some living well programs. If you have not joined one of our virtual Zumba classes, I suggest you go to harvardpilgrim.org and uh, learn more about it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. And hello to everyone who's saying hello in the chat. If you're sure to make sure you're saying hello to everyone, please let us know that you're here. It's great to see the mix of folks who are tuning in from all over the state. Um, someone from Dresden, Catherine Wygant Fawcett from Booth Bay, um, folks from all over. Now with that, I'd like to begin the discussion and introduce Press Herald Director of Special Projects, Carol Coltis. Carol. Thanks, Kate. Welcome everyone. We're delighted you could be here. Uh, about a month ago, we had three other food service uh, entrepreneurs on Making It Work to talk about what they were doing to pivot and try to drive some revenue while the pandemic was forcing the closure of all the restaurants uh, throughout the state. And they were terrific. And they all talked about ways that they were initiating curbside and takeout service. Uh, so now we're a month later in the calendar. Things have changed a little. Um, and we have three different food service um, entrepreneurs who are with us today to talk about sort of the next level of innovation that, that these folks have embraced and also how they're preparing for the eventual reopening and hopefully the return to normal uh, with their businesses. So um, just a, a word about the format. We're gonna chat for about a half hour or so, and then we will open it up to questions. Uh, you can use the raise the hand option in Zoom in order to address your question to Strawberry, who's our magical IT person behind the scenes, and she'll queue up everyone. So we got a lot of ground to cover. So let me uh, make brief introductions and then we'll get rolling. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Andrew Voke. Andrew and his wife, Brianna, opened the Portline Hunt and Alpine Club in 2013. Uh, Andrew's a Colby grad, so he has some, some good main roots here. Um, the, the restaurant and bar have been recognized twice by the James Beard uh, Foundation. They've been semifinalists oh in the best bar program. And just last year, we're named one of the top 20 uh, bars in the entire country by Thrillist. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Carol. Thanks and for... then also in downtown Portland, we have Sir Lee, which is which is owned by Krista Cole. Krista is a Holton native. Uh, she was a nurse, and then she decided to go back to school for a graduate degree in business and entrepreneurship. Um, she opened uh, Sir Lee in, oh, let me just double check this, 2014. It's a uh, tapas and small plate. It specializes in, in tapas and small plates. And her co-owner, um, Antonio Alviar, uh, she met while the two of them were waiting tables in Bar Harbor in 2005. So welcome, Krista. Okay. And our final panelist is Vanessa Santarelli. So Vanessa had a career working in nonprofits and with state government before she answered the entrepreneurial bug that was inside her. And in 2017, opened Your Main Concierge, which is a concierge and curating service for people who want to get the most out of their experiences in Maine. So she will 
line up reservations at particular restaurants or suggest attractions to go to, places to see, um, entertainment to take in. Uh, but because of her restaurant connections, she knows pretty much every chef and restaurant owner in the state. And so she's going to be talking with a little bit of a not greater Portland focus. Uh, she's based in Rockland and that community has actually um, taken some initiatives to try to help their restaurant community, which are now sort of being replicated here in Portland. So welcome to everyone. And let me get the ball rolling first by asking Krista, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing with Sir Lee to drive additional, you know, to drive some revenue while everyone is working under these restrictions and how that has gone for you in terms of what's the impact been on your staffing and your revenues? Go right ahead. Yeah, thank you, Carol. Um, so, Surly, um, we shut down um, on the, the 15th of March and uh, closed for in-house uh, in dining and then opened up a couple days later for a, with a completely different and new uh, curbside and takeout menu. Um, so we started doing curbside takeout and delivery with two dine-in. That went pretty well uh, for the first three or four weeks. We were able to bring some of our team back in the kitchen. And uh, once we kind of started realizing that this pandemic was um, you know, serious and that the restaurant industry was gonna look a lot different for a while mm -hmm. and we weren't gonna be open up for full capacity until we're not really quite sure when, we really decided that we needed to do something that was a little more sustainable. So we started um, thinking about some of the things that are most important to us um, at Surly, which is our local vendors. And um, that's a theme that um, is not just unique to us. Portland in general is very focused on buying local. So we started a farmer's uh, market basket. And what we do every week is we, we post sales. Um, we put sales up on Thursdays and folks can order them until Sunday. And the baskets come with local vegetables, local meats, local cheese, local bread. Uh, we work with two of our small family owned wine distributors to do a fun wine pairing uh, with every basket each week. Um, we offer seafood uh, from Sopo Seafood. We're buying um, baked goods from Ilma Lopez, who's the chef owner of Piccolo and Cheval. And um, really just trying to rally around some of the people that we work really closely with, some of our partners, and helping to kind of um, support many businesses in one. So that's been absolutely amazing. It's been well received. Folks are having a lot of fun getting their baskets full of goodies and posting pictures of what they're making. So um, we've been very blessed that we were able to really pivot and be very innovative with what we're doing. And how, how has it been in terms of revenue? Has it been significant? Yeah, um, the, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to, um, to say it's significant compared to being open, obviously, but we've been able to, you know, get caught up on our rent and, um, you know, start to be, you know, the hope is that even though we've had amazing landlords and, <laughs> Everyone's been really supportive with, you know, letting folks, you know, defer rent, for example. Um, you know, most of us are going to owe that rent when we open back up. And at some point that rent's going to come due. So for us, um, it's just allowed us to put some money towards things that, so that we're not in such a big hole when we do open back up. So it's been very significant. Yeah. Good. And how about you, Andrew? Yeah, um, we, like Krista and, and so many restaurants across the state, close our doors on, on March 15th as well. Um, we chose not to step into to-go opportunities immediately because for those of you who know Hunt and Alpine or for those of you who don't know Hunt and Alpine, um, we're in downtown Portland where there's not nearly as much residential as, as some other places. We also are known <laughs> more as a bar um, and there were no true to-go alcoholic options um, available. And there were, there were really great restaurants that we're doing excellent jobs like Krista and many other places in town that we didn't feel like it was quite our place to be doing anything to go immediately. Um, you know, we spent the time, my wife and I spent the time working with our staff, making sure that they were taken care of, making sure they understood what their options were and working with both state and federal um, representatives on, on trying to 
push forward some legislation, some help, uh, which ended up being in the CARES Act and, and then helping, uh, trying to guide some of the changes in the PPP, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, which you know, is, is, was a great start, but truly doesn't work for our industry. Um, we decided at Hunt and Alpine to start offering to go when Bablo, the um, alcoholic board here in Maine, chose, decided to allow pre-batched cocktails for sale to go. Um, which was a, a significant change from anything we'd ever seen here in Maine before. Um, and so we've been offering to go with cocktails and food for about three weeks now. Um, it's exceeded every expectation. We've been able to bring back about a third of our staff. Um, wow. but, you know, the entire thing is, it's a new business model. You know, we're, we're truly writing a new business model um, every day. And there's, it's very difficult to, to plan and, and set projections. You know, it's one of those that, we, we've built out weekly projections for the past, you know, we've been open seven years. So I, I could have told you without COVID what we would make this week. Um, but with COVID, it, it's, there's a whole new, whole new model that we're building and figuring out kind of moment by moment, day by day as, uh, as things change. So we're continually updating our offerings um, and happy to talk more about that. Can you, so one of the things you mentioned, Andrew, is I know that Bablo, that there had to be some legal, some law changes in order for you to be able to, to do what you're doing. But did you also have to come up with like um, uh, the containers that you're selling your pre-batches in and the design, like that's a whole other aspect to your business you weren't doing previously, that's right? True. That's very true. We were not offering to-go cocktails before before the coronavirus. Um, you know, so Bablo, it wasn't it wasn't a law change. It was a a, a guy, what they call a guidance memo, um, which is to say that it wasn't passed by the legislature. It's not a permanent change, but it's something that that Governor Mills and her administration through Bablo has has allowed us to do indefinitely for the time being. Um, there were a number of changes that that kind of stepped towards offering pre-mixed cocktails. Businesses like ours and, and Krista's that have on-premise licenses were allowed to sell cans of beer and unopened bottles of wine um, fairly quickly. And, and you know, I commend the administration and certainly Bablo for for changing things and, and recognizing that we needed to, you know, we need to to diversify our revenue streams. We needed to, needed to adapt our business models. Um, the sale of cocktails to go, especially in a state that in Maine, Maine has fairly conservative liquor laws when you compare across the 50 states um, and changes like that took some time. You know, we, we, a number of businesses had conversations with the administrators of Bablo about what was appropriate, what was, um, what was going to work both on the administrative side and, and on the restaurant side. Um, you know, they, they settled on, on something called tamper evident containers, um, which means a lot of different things that I've seen interpreted a lot of different ways across restaurants and bars here in Portland. Um, for us, we have the screw caps that seal and cinch down and have a little neck around them, something that you'd see on a milk bottle. Um, and we, we were able to source small plastic containers that fit the, the, the volume regulations that Pablo put out there. Um, we we employed one of our bartender, our head bartender, Sylvie Roy, who, who's an art school graduate to, um, to design the labels. And they, you know, kind of, we, but you're right, this has been a whole new aspect to our business that, that we certainly never planned on doing. Um, because, well, because it wasn't allowed before, um, but, but it's, it's fun and different and challenging and um, we're, we're absolutely pleased that we have the opportunity to even explore this part of it. So before I bring Vanessa into the conversation, Andrew and Krista, will you continue doing your, Krista, your farmer's baskets and Andrew, your to-go cocktails once things return to normal? Yeah, um, we will continue our farmer's baskets for the foreseeable future. Um, it's been an amazing process and um, people are having so much fun with it. And I think it's going to be something that we can rely on um, while we do ramp up because the regulations are very restricted. Um, and so we're not going to be at full capacity anytime soon. So we definitely will. Yeah. And absolutely. Yeah. As long as the state of Maine is allowing us to sell cocktails to go, we're going to sell cocktails to go. Um, you know, I think that, that what both Krista and I are, are, will, will continually say is, and I don't want to speak for you, Krista, but, but the restaurant industry has changed. And, you know, we don't expect to be back to our 100% revenue projections um, really anytime soon. 
and, and by that I mean probably 18 months at the very least. Wow. Um, so what, what I'm saying to anybody who asks is we hope that the administration will allow cocktails to go and allow some of these looser restrictions for the foreseeable future until we're back to 100%. Um, you know, <laughs> that probably means a vaccine to all of this. Wow. Vanessa, what are you seeing outside of the greater Portland area? Where, what innovations are you identifying? Yeah, so thank you so much for letting me participate today. Um, so I think um, just as uh, Krista and Andrew shared, um, you know, seeing a lot of curbside to go take out um, up here in the Rockland area in particular, um, there's a lot of innovations going on among the restaurant uh, community and the innkeepers. Um, this community is so special because um, you know, it really comes together. And I think that there's a lot of support um, for one another. And um, we're seeing that um, some of the innovations that are going on up here, um, just by way of example, uh, Primo Restaurant, Chef Melissa Kelly, um, they're, um, they're doing, um, they're building picnic tables um, and possibly doing an expansion for outside seating when um, they make a decision um, to reopen. They're also um, selling, they're, they're going to be selling, I believe, produce, uh, veggies, and, um, and uh, greens, and uh, their Primo eggs, which are so wonderful, um, from their farm, which is on the premises. They also have themed um, evenings, so um, people from the community will know, you know, every Tuesday it's barbecue night, or every Friday it's pizza night. Um, restaurants up here that had not previously done delivery services like Ada's um, and uh, Natalie's at the Camden Harbor Inn. Um, so those are some new sort of changes that the restaurants are making to adapt and to accommodate, um, you know, social distancing and keeping people safe. Cafe Miranda with Chef Carrie Altiero, um, you know, beloved restaurant up here known as having one of the largest and most diverse menus, I think, in the whole state of Maine has actually on to a format um, with pizza in the streets. Um, so he's actually brought his wood fired oven up to his patio and um, is doing uh, large pizzas, uh, wood fired pizzas and salads for families. Um, Nina June over in Rockport is doing a pantry. So La Dispensa, so fresh pastas and other pantry sort of items that people can come in and purchase and take home. Um, actually, and Chef Jenkins has also just um, announced that she's going to be doing, um, starting I think in July and August, dinners for just groups of 10 out on her deck. Prefix dinners um, so that the restaurant's not full, but that people can still come and have that experience. And um, even, uh, you know, other, uh, you know, local cheesemakers and others are starting to actually, you know, make prepared foods and um, sell, you know, other types of um, products that maybe they hadn't been doing before, just um, to, you know, try to keep revenue coming in so that they can continue their business after all of this is over. Um, also, I've seen some um, restaurants um, switching models completely. So um, I've seen that there are a couple of restaurants that are actually going to a food truck model, so not going to have their physical locations, but moving to a more food truck um, oriented model. And um, just uh, for um, uh, talking to one of the restaurant owners up in Lubeck, Cohills Co Inn, which is the easternmost pub and restaurant in the country, um, Charles um, and Ellen up there, I believe are gonna go to a more limited menu. Um, so I think everybody's trying to figure it out. I don't think, um, and, you know, Mainers are resilient and they're being innovative. And I think that that's, they're making it work. And just with respect to my business, um, one of the things that I do is I work with a lot of chefs around the state, private chef um, experiences at someone's private home or things like that. So if people don't want to be, you know, coming out when rest, you know, the restaurants are starting to reopen, um, that's also an option. So it's a way that I'm trying to innovate a little bit to make my business work and also give um, people who want to have, you know, this beautiful food that they've always been enjoying outside at these restaurants bringing it into their own homes, so. Wow, lots going on. Yes, you, there is. You had mentioned too that some of the restaurants have begun collaborating uh, so that they are coordinating the days that they're open for curbside and takeout 
so that not everyone is doing Thursday through Sunday, but are spreading it out to, to try to, you know, help one another um, get a, a, some portion of that pie, so. Yes, I think that that's been going on certainly here. Um, and also I think, you know, the use of social media and email newsletters among all of the restaurant owners, like every day at a certain time, you know, we're gonna get, you know, updated menus and things of that nature so that people can place their orders and um, people are starting to expect that now. So I do think that that's also helping the restaurant owners to, you know, draw more, um, you know, business um, from the communities. Cool. So as we mentioned, things are rolling along at sort of a pretty fast clip. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the state announced that 12 of the 16 counties, the restaurants could begin opening on a restricted basis. The more rural counties, I think it's this week. Um, and um, Rockland has closed its downtown to allow uh, more sidewalk space available for, uh, for restaurants. Portland is doing a similar thing. They're trying to close off downtown to, uh, to vehicle traffic so that uh, restaurants and other businesses will have an expanded uh, place that they can do business from. So I'm curious, um, how are you guys preparing for, for, your, uh, for these changing you know, conditions? What, what are, what's the metric? Like, what are you looking at in terms of making your decision about how best to take advantage of this easing of the restrictions and hoping that at some point the, you know, things will return to normal. Um, Krista, why don't you start with that one? Um, so we're, we're talking a lot about um, that this week, but uh, for us, we'll continue our farmer baskets um, and free street doesn't have any plans to close. Uh, we've got a limited availability to maybe have some seating outside, but we'll probably keep with takeout and delivery um, curbside and then open up the restaurant to a small amount of indoor seating um, based on the guidelines. So um, we are we also have MJ's wine bar down the street. So we're hoping to maybe, you know, again, pull in some other businesses and try to just collaborate and support each other. Um, so yeah, that's what we've been talking about. Okay. How about you, Andrew? Um, Carol, you asked what the metric is. You know, yeah. for us, the, the biggest metric is safety. Um, safety for our staff, safety for our space, safety for, for our guests and our customers. Um, we've, we've made the decision for Hunt and Alpine, and, and, you know, I think that everyone makes an individual decision. I respect that. But for us, we're not opening for any in-dining. Um, for the foreseeable future, you know, they, at least come June 1, um, we're not going to be opening our doors. We're going to expand our to-go offerings. You know, we just this week, we uh, we started offering some curated grocery options. We started offering kind of some backyard kits that have cocktails and food and sort of a one-stop. You click click one button and you get a whole thing of several different cocktails that we've made along with uh, a number of food items that we've uh, we've made and, and brought in. Um, but for us, I think the, the initial plan is to expand that and do it in a safe way. Um, you know, we're talking about what private events in our space would look like um, given the given the state guidelines, but it, it just doesn't seem like a safe time to be opening, particularly for a space as small as ours and for a staff as small as ours. Um, it doesn't quite make sense for us and, and we're gonna do that only when we feel, we and our staff feel comfortable uh, and ready to do that. Mm, interesting. You had mentioned, Andrew, at the beginning of our conversation that you didn't think the PPP was especially well designed to help the restaurant industry. Sure. What would help the restaurant industry? Um, you know, there, there are a number of proposals out there. In fact, they're discussing, the, when I say they, um, the U.S. House just passed a changes to the PPP, proposed changes to the PPP, and the Senate is, um, is debating it this week. Um, those are good starts, but Truly, you know, I think restaurants and the hospitality industry as a whole has been on the leading edge of the effects of coronavirus. You know, our business models, all of ours, are based on the gathering of people. Um, and we can't gather, you know, so something that is targeted specifically towards our industry would be phenomenal. Um, I'm not going to get into whether the politically that makes sense or not, but there are people nationally working on that. There's something called the International, the um, Independent Restaurant Coalition, IRC that's led by a number of big name chefs that you would recognize across the country. And they're doing some really excellent work in proposing a restaurant stabilization fund 
Um, and and I, I think that they're introducing that legislation next week. Um, you know, the PPP, as it's written currently, doesn't work because it basically made you take money immediately and start spending it immediately, but our businesses were not allowed to be open immediately. Um, and there, there was a very short clock that you had to spend that money within, um, you know, with details of which I'm happy to get into, but, but for the most part, it, the, things are going to be changing fairly quickly, it seems like. Mm, interesting. Um, where else are you guys seeing innovation, like with your suppliers or your vendors or, um, you know, just in the, in the wider sphere of the business context you have, where are you seeing other people doing interesting and innovative things? One of the things that, that, that I've noticed, um, we have a number of friends who operate restaurants in New York. And certainly the New York market and the Portland Maine market are very different, but many of them are very small restaurants that also are choosing not to open, but are really expanding grocery options as, um, you know, the, the, the understanding, the belief, and we're, we're kind of taking some cues from them when it comes to this, is that those of us in the restaurant industry and in the hospitality profession really know where to get some of the best meats and some of the best cheeses and some of the best this, that, and the other. And, and oftentimes you can't find that in your grocery store or right now you don't feel safe going to your grocery store. Um, so at Hutton Alpine, we're offering some of our favorites of that. We're also offering Portland City trash bags for sale that you can go online, pick up trash bags, pick up a, you know, a five pound bag of flour, maybe buy a couple of cocktails or a box of wine as well. Um, you know, things along that, that nature. And, and you're going to hear all of us say it's about diversifying revenue streams and, and rewriting our business models now. How can we um, take advantage of, of what we're doing and what we've always been known for doing, but, but in a socially distant way. Yeah, just picking up on what Andrew said, um, one of the services that I've provided to clients of mine over the, uh, since I started was provisioning just in the same way that he was talking about. So, you know, partnerships with local cheese makers and um, sausage makers and farmers. And so I have the ability to, you know, go out and, and get these products for people so that when they, you know, previously when they arrived, they immediately started having the sort of fresh flavors from Maine um, without having to, you know, worry about going around and shopping and trying to sort of source all of that stuff on, on a, upon arrival. So now um, that service is, is morphing into a little bit of a different area, but um, I certainly agree that that, that is a, a huge benefit, I think, to a lot of people and I think uh, to the business owners who are um, who aren't just restaurant owners and, uh, you know, but those who are producers and, and fishermen and farmers and, and such. So um, some of the other things that I've been seeing around are that some of the restaurant owners in other parts of the state have been talking about is um, when they decide to open. And I think, um, as Andrew and Krista said, it's an independent decision that each restaurant is making. And I don't think any of them are really taking it lightly is um, you know, whether they're going to do expanded hours, opening earlier, staying open later. Um, you know, uh, some are even contemplating doing lunch service if they only did dinner service before. Um, just trying to figure out ways to um, innovate as you were talking about, Carol, um, to try to make it work so that they can be around when things get back to whatever normal is. So one, I just wanna to mention too, in our previous conversation, Vanessa, you mentioned that in Knox County, there's a sort of an e-commerce platform that anyone can, can join called Opportunity Knox. And I imagine that that is especially helpful as people are doing things that they hadn't been doing previously, wasn't really in their wheelhouse to prepare things for curbside or, or take up. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. So um, I, I was approached um, by Chef Carrie Altiero, um, the folks who um, operate the Steel House, and um, uh, and Tom Pico from the Penn, uh, Penn Bay Chamber to serve as sort of the voluntary program manager. So um, basically, it's a unified payment platform that was designed called Opportunity Knox, and people can visit the website at opportunitynox.me. Um, and basically, any um, local businesses in the Knox um, in Knox County or nonprofits, so AIO Food Pantry, Pause Animal Adoption Services. It's not just for um, uh, business owners, but also for nonprofits. And so, um, on that platform, you can see all the different businesses and nonprofits listed. 
and you can make um, a contribution, either a donation um, for something as little as $10 up to whatever amount you choose, and you can um, make those contributions for multiple businesses on that one platform. So if you decide to spend, say, $100 and you want to do $25 to Boynt McKay, uh, $25 to, um, you know, to Ada's, uh, $25 to two of the nonprofits, um, you will get receipts that show that if it's to a restaurant, for example, you'll get a gift certificate, um, a notice, um, and a receipt. And then for the nonprofits, they will contact you just to thank you for the contribution. So it's, it's you know, I mean, we, we uh, launched it, um, I think, just over a month ago. Um, and, you know, a ton of businesses have signed up for it. Um, we've been really, uh, you know, pleased by the, su the support that we've been seeing come through on that platform. So, yes, thank you for mentioning it. I saw that um, one of the questions from in our chat function, I think it came from Steve DeMillo. He was wondering, Krista and Andrew, do you use a, a delivery service for your takeout options or do people have to physically come to your location in order to pick up their orders? Uh, we, we had just started working with Two Dine In in February um, and kind of testing that out. So that was something that we had already started doing. So we do offer it um, through Two Dine In. We don't use some of the other platforms. We liked the fact that Two Dine In is a local um, family owned uh, delivery service, but we do use them. And so far it's been great um, reaching another market. So certainly has been pretty successful with that. Even though you know our, we had to pivot our menu um, being a tapas style farm to table restaurant. So um, we definitely had to make it more, what do, what do people want to eat when they eat takeout? So. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're not offering any delivery options as of yet. You know, for us, because a, a large majority of our options are our offerings are, are alcoholic, we're kind of exploring right. the liability side of things when it right. comes to that. Um, you know, alcohol delivery is something that's fairly new to the state anyway and and being you know being part of that we're looking at how we can do that um, but we're also very fortunate to be on a street that has a has a fairly decent amount of commercial parking and, and sort of very short term parking uh you know 15 minute spots directly out front so coming and picking up at hunt and Alpine has not been uh, not been an issue for for us thankfully I guess that's a silver lining of, uh, of the pandemic. You can navigate Portland's streets without a whole lot of trouble these days. Hmm. There's um. always parking downtown. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm, I see that we're a little bit past our uh, 1.30 uh, cutoff for our conversation. And I also see we've got a lot of questions in the queue. So why don't we uh, segue now and, and Strawberry, can you queue up the first question for us, please? I sure can. And just a reminder, if you'd like to ask your question live, go ahead and use that uh, raise your hand option and I'll go ahead and um, you can ask your question live. Um, but submitted through the Q&A, um, our first question we have in here is, what are the panelists thoughts on the pushback hospitality Maine did to the governor's quarantine orders? Shouldn't that organization work harder to be more creative to engage more Maine people? Ah, a political question right <laughs> off the bat. Would anyone like to, to offer an opinion? I will. <laughs> I, I, I have on TV a couple of times and in the paper, um, I appreciate the question. You know, I, I think that, as, as I said before, our metric for reopening is safety. Um, and I think that, I, and I hope that our political leaders, both at the local level, the state level, and the federal level, if at all possible, their metric for reopening should be safety as well. Um, you know, I, I am not an epidemiologist. I'm a, I'm a bartender that happens to own a bar and a restaurant. Um, I, I think that we should be listening to the experts and the experts say that it's a terrible idea to just let people into our state. Um, you know, I think that there are safe ways of doing that. And I think that the governor has done, along with Dr. Shaw at the Maine CDC, has done an excellent job of responding to what's going on. Um, you know, my fear, and look, I, I have I am a tourist driven business in, in many ways. I understand the economic and the health side of things. Um, and, and, you know, I know that, that a large majority of people that would come here right now would be coming from two of the biggest hotspots in the country in Boston and New York. And I don't want to become a sixth borough of New York City and see a spike in Cumberland County um, or, or anywhere else across the state. That's scary. 
um, you know, I, I, I trust that the governor will, will continue to do the right thing. Um, you know, I think that, that just opening the door and letting anybody in and saying, come on in, you, you feel welcome is, um, let's say you're responsible. I think that there are responsible ways of doing it. I think that there's somewhere, somewhere in between um, everything can work out well. Great. Anyone yeah, else? I, I was going to say, I, I think, um, and I agree with Andrew as well, um, you know, being in, being a healthcare professional first and then a restaurant owner second, you know, I think listening to the professionals and doing what's, what's best for our community and, you know, everyone's coming from a different place and it, it is a scary time. It's scary to think of losing your business and losing your livelihood and, and that does create fear and that creates, um, you know, um, folks to, ha to have to make different decisions based on where they're at. So, but, um, you know, for, for me personally, I've always believed that um, human lives um, come first and the safety of our community and the safety of our workers. So, absolutely. Yeah. So, and I, I would just say, um, I mean, in my previous career, I, I had the opportunity to work with uh, Governor Mills when she was a legislator. And I know that um, she cares very deeply about the business community. And I don't think that she takes um, any of these decisions lightly for sure. Um, I would say I've been a little bit concerned about some of the hyperbolic language though, um, not on all sides, but I think that, I think that you know, people are scared, people are concerned, um, and we all recognize that. But I think that uh, there, there are times where I've seen comments about sort of blood being on people's hands and things of that nature that I don't know um, help with um, some of the um, discussions and sort of trying to find and identify solutions, but rather um, create that sort of defensiveness. And, um, and I think people need to come from those places of understanding um, a little bit more, um, especially in this time when we need to come together to try to make uh, make this work so that our economy doesn't completely collapse. <laughs> um, you know, recognizing that public safety and, and the health of our people is uh, paramount. Wow, very, very thoughtful responses, all three of you. Um, how about the next question? Uh, do you have projections of how the industry can bounce back without a summer tourism season? Hmm. You know, I think that, that a lot of us, um, and Vanessa and Krista and myself, all in our, our own respective businesses and ways, um, are already thinking about how do we pivot to serving Mainers? Um, you know, right now, we, we, there is a 14-day quarantine, whether you like it or not, for anybody coming in. Um, so how do, we, how do we offer what we're going to, what, what we typically would offer to perhaps out-of-staters? How do we offer that to Mainers? How do we as a community come together? You know, I think um, like we, we all believe very firmly and strongly in, in the resilience of Maine and, and the really strong community of our state. Um, and, and to be able to offer things that people want right now and, and, and have them support our businesses, I think is, is the way to do it. You know, projection wise, number wise, it's gonna be a whole lot worse than it was last summer. Um, but, but how do we do that? You know, how do we tweak our, our business models in a way that um, makes financial sense? Do you, do you have a specific example, Andrew? Is there something that you're already getting ready to launch that? <laughs> I, my, my daughter just woke up from a nap. Um, you know, one, uh, uh, a specific example of, of things that we're offering that we didn't, you know, right now we're, we're selling curated wine boxes um, that we typically would offer by the glass, things that we're really excited about right now. Um, we're putting in boxes and saying, hey, come, come and get this. We're also offering, um, what we're calling backyard barbecue kits and picnic kits um, and, and, brec and brunch kits, which have some food, a couple of cocktails that are developed for those particular moments. Um, you know, we're also putting together non-alcoholic cocktail mixes that people can grab. They can buy 32 ounce, large 32 ounce bottles of things that we batched out already um, and then add their bottle of their favorite spirit. Um, and, you know, we offer recommendations, but you know everybody's got a bottle of gin sitting at their bar at home that they really haven't touched in five years, um, potentially. Some of us, <laughs> but but you know, there are things that 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 you can do with that, um, you know. It, and so it's it's pivoting to, again, like I said, offering stuff that we we are typically known for, but in new ways and new formats. Oh, great, that's great. Um, are we ready for another question? How about another one, Strawberry? 
All right. Uh, do you anticipate any increase in demand for Maine seafood products from local restaurants, dining and takeout services in June or July as restaurants reopen? That's a good question. Yes. Um, I know, I know, I don't know um, the, the answer to that um, exactly, but I, I do know that for like our farmer baskets, we just started offering seafood and that's been something that folks have really been asking for. And um, ever since we started including that, it's been selling very well. So I would, so if I was to, you know, look at, look at that data, I would say that um, there is definitely a, a demand for it um, and the sustainability um, aspect of that as well that people are being conscious of, so. Yeah, and I, just to pick up on Krista's point, a lot of the oyster farmers are also, um, you know, offering really uh, unique packages um, and sort of shucking, uh, in, in instructional shucking classes and things of that nature. So um, you can, you know, also support, you know, the local oyster farmers and, um, and have that beautiful um, uh, option as well, so. Oh, that's great. I'm sure the lobstermen and the oyster farmers and everyone else is hoping that that these projections, um, you know, play out because I live in Harpswell, which is a fishing village. And so everyone is really concerned about where, yeah, you can go out and catch your lobster, but where are you going to sell it? And so, um, so that's a, that's a big concern I hear a lot about. I think several of the lobster shacks, the ones that have the outdoor seating, I'm, I'm seeing that they are starting to open up. So, um, you know, I think they are spacing out tables a little bit more. I know um, McLoon's has a certain process um, that they're asking their customers to, which is, I think, call and order in advance. And so that they're, you know, managing um, sort of the flow of traffic coming in and, and things of that nature. So yes, I, I think that um, my hope is that we're going to have lots of fresh lobster this, this summer to enjoy here as well. From your lips to God's ears, let's hope. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have another question, I think, Strawberry? I was going to say, we actually do have somebody with their hand up. So oh, okay, yes. Katie Pinard, you are all set to go ahead and ask your question. Um, hey there, everyone. Really appreciate everything you're all doing and just your level-headedness um, and gracefulness. Uh, extremely challenging times. Uh, I'm the owner of Elements, uh, books, coffee, beer in Biddeford, and um, weighing a lot of the same, you know, decisions that you are. One thing that we're trying to figure out is like protocol. If a staff member is either exposed to COVID uh, or becomes symptomatic, um, what, what, are our, what, are, what are our steps, um, both in terms of like immediately, um, uh, do we have to close? <laughs> um, do we have to inform our community? Um, what are our responsibilities to our staff and um, to our customers if something happens? And just curious to know what your thoughts are and internal conversations that you all have been having around those kinds of things and risk management and liability and etc. Thank you. Andrew, do you want to do sure, I, I'm sorry. Katie, thank you for the question. Okay. Um, and also I love elements. I'm glad to hear you. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's from our perspective, sort of the number one step that we have been taking with our staff is very clear, very open communication. Um, you know, I think that that's in a time where things are very scary, being communicative about what we're thinking, about the choices we're making, why we're making them, um, it, it, both around safety and around just business choices um, is, is step number one. Um, you know, also being clearly communicative to your guests as far as what safety steps you are taking, what precautions you are taking. Um, you know, specifically when it comes to potential exposure and potential cases, um, I, the state of Maine and the CDC has an infectious disease line um, and I'm happy to put the number in the chat if you don't have it or for everybody. Um, and, and I've actually called it a number of times really with questions. Um, you know, there was, there was sort of a rumor in the building that we were in that somebody in another office potentially was exposed. It was one of those, I, again, I'm not an epidemiologist. I've never spent a, a, a moment professionally as a healthcare provider, um, but there is a phone number that you can call. They take your name, they take your questions and they have an epidemiologist, an infectious disease expert call you back. 
and you can have a conversation with them about whatever questions you have surrounding this or, or, or frankly, any other infectious disease. Um, and it's been, you know, they, they've called me back within 20 minutes of me placing the initial call. They spent as much time answering, frankly, the same question three different ways um, with me and, and were very giving of their time and very common and informative. And, and I would absolutely recommend, if you have any questions at all around reopening, um, beyond reading the governor's guidance, beyond reading the CDC guidance, being able to call and talk to somebody and ask specific questions has been incredibly helpful. Yeah, I would agree with Andrew that um, the CDC will give you um, guidelines in terms of what to do next and what your next steps are. Um, you know, as a restaurant group in downtown Portland, we are, um, we do, Andrew and I are both on a leaders call each week and we, you know, all chat every week about what, what's going on, what we're facing. We're actually trying to, and if you want to shoot me an email, I can get you um, into the emails that this group is a part of, but we're really trying to come up with guidelines as a group of restaurants. And instead of each having each restaurant have to kind of reinvent the wheel, um, you know, have guidelines that are very um, concise and consistent and so that we, we all have the same message for our guests moving forward. Um, and there are, uh, part of the guidelines do have, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Part of the guidelines uh, does require you to keep track of the staffing and the guests that are coming in and out of your establishment. So um, there is documentation requirements. So um, if you want to get in on that group, then we can share some of that information with you for sure. So you feel supported. Anybody um, that has questions or just needs a little bit of support, we're, we're all um, in this together and we all uh, have a lot of questions. So. Um, and I think we have time for one more question and then we'll have to wrap things up. And we do have a great last one in the Q&A. Um, are you thinking of offering virtual mixology classes and cooking demos to keep consumers engaged with your brands? <laughs> uh, we've been doing, um, we've been doing virtual wine dinners with WineWise since the shutdown uh, and that's been really cool. Uh, Erica Archer is the founder of WineWise. So she comes and picks up the meal, uh, delivers it to your house uh, with a wine pairing, and then everyone logs on. Um, our executive chef is on the dinner with you and has reheating instructions, and it's uh, very interactive and very engaging, and it has been a huge hit. Uh, there's also a lot of folks who have interest in uh, asking if we have recipes for some of the items that we're providing in our market baskets, which right now it's a basket full of fresh meats and veggies. So we've been toying with the idea of maybe having some interactive um, cooking classes with Jeff, but we'll see if that comes <laughs> or not. For our part, we, my wife Brown has been leading, um, an issue. she's been leading a set of, of sort of pop-up wine, uh, pop-up dinners throughout the past year or so called Hush Hush that is a, a certain type of wine, a certain type of drink paired with food, paired with a, a, a type of music. Um, so at one point we did, I think, Sicilian wine with pizza and disco music or something along those lines. <laughs> so we're starting to put together a Hush Hush for next month um, where it's a you, similar to what Chris is talking about. You come to Hunt Up Wine, you pick up an entire box, it has your entire meal. Um, and there's going to be a playlist involved with that. There's not quite the sign on and interact in the same way um, that we're doing now. But 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 you know I think we're all trying to take take advantage of the technology that that you know we're we're using on a daily basis and figuring out how to wrap that into um, what we're offering. We're also working with a couple of brands on um, like spirit brands and spirit producers on videos that or specific to our cocktails and, and the, the menu at Hunt and Alpine. So how do you make this drink and why is what makes this drink special because of this thing um, and, and being able to put those out there for anyone to access whenever they want. Wow, that's all great. That's terrific. Um, so uh, I was just going to ask Andrew, thank you for, for putting that hotline number up. Can you also post a link uh, to the work that the International Restaurant Coalition is trying to do in, in terms of in terms of what they're trying to do from a regulatory or for an assistance point of view. I think it would be great if others could see that and and as in the journalists in the newsroom can pay attention to it and and check and track its progress. 
Yeah, it's called um, the Independent Restaurant Coalition. I'll put the website there in the in the chat box, but it's saverestaurants.com. Okay. Um, they're doing they're, they're they're doing a significant amount of work. It's a group that's been around for about seven weeks now, but has uh, has has a bit of lobbying power behind it and a fair bit of money backed by um, some industry partners like American Express. Cool, great. Um, well, this is the part of our of our uh, little segment where I thank everyone, and you should be hearing thunderous applause if we were in the Portland Public Library where we've been doing our breakfast forums for six years now. Uh, but this has been just terrific. I, uh, I think that all of you have given fabulous advice and are obviously knowledgeable about the industry and are very thoughtful in terms of how you see these things playing out. So um, I think it's reassuring to, to hear your perspectives and, and I really appreciate that you, that you all took the time uh, to join us today. Mm -hmm.